welcome and thank you for joining us. Good evening, my name is Jenny Denford and I am the NDIS Transition Lead here at the Central and Eastern Sydney PHN. Welcome to tonight's webinar, Session 1, Health of People with Intellectual Disability, Setting the Scene. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians and sovereign people of the land across which we work. We recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. We also extend that respect to any Aboriginal colleagues who may be joining us today. I would like to remind you the coronavirus page on the Central and Eastern Sydney PHN website contains links and resources to support general practice, including all the latest updates. If you have a question or would like additional support, please email coronavirus at sesbon.com.au. Central and Eastern Sydney PHN also has intellectual disability web pages for GPs, allied health and community with a list of resources which is regularly updated. This webinar will be uploaded to the Intellectual Disability page. Additionally, Central and Eastern Sydney PHN also facilitates a disability network. This is held six times a year. If you would like to become a member, please email myself, j.denford at cesphn.com.au for further information. I would now like to introduce you to Dr. Alexis Berry, Staff Specialist, Rehabilitation Medicine, Disability Assessment and Rehabilitation Team for Young People, Concord Hospital, Staff Specialist, Rehabilitation Medicine, Specialist Intellectual Disability Health Team, Sydney, Strides, Royden Healthcare Centre. Over to you, Dr. Berry. Thank you very much, Jenny. And thank you to everyone who is joining us tonight. Um, tonight's very much a joint presentation. So uh, as Jenny mentioned, I'm part of the Specialised Intellectual Disability Service um, for Sydney Local Health District. And tonight um, I'm joined by my CNC, Maria Heaton, who you'll hear from later in the presentation. And together with two of the team members from the South Eastern Sydney um, Specialised Intellectual Disability team, Paula Griffin and Dr. Titra Parra, um, will be hoping to present to you tonight um, a varied presentation with a focus on trying to provide some education around the health inequalities and barriers to healthcare that people with intellectual disability in our district face. Um, some of the evidence around the, the current state of play for health and people with intellectual disability and also hoping to talk a little bit around how GPs and tertiary health services for that matter can modify practice and implement strategies um, to support the health needs of people with intellectual disability. And lastly, um, we hope to introduce to you um, the two new teams that um, are relevant for the people in, with intellectual disability in our districts. So first up, and we want to make sure, you know, putting it right out there at the beginning, that we completely recognise that people with intellectual disability need um, a variety of different services at different points in their journey through the healthcare system. And that at all times, the general practitioner is the primary health clinician throughout that person's life. And we're very lucky, both within the Southeastern Sydney and Sydney Local Health District, to have some incredibly experienced GPs and GP practices that have been working to support the people with intellectual disability for many, many years. And throughout this presentation, we would encourage you, if you have any questions or, or thoughts, to send them through to Jenny and she'll be forwarding them through to us. Um, we'd really like to have the opportunity at the end tonight to have a question and answer session. Um, and that can be about whatever yourselves as attendees would like to know about, any clinical cases that you might want to have a um, sounding board of. Um, and also if there are any GPs out there who have had either um, successes or, or failures supporting people with um, health needs and intellectual disability, we'd really invite you to 
participate towards the question and answer session at the end. Um, so I guess we'll keep moving along. Um, and I'd like to introduce you now to Paula Griffin, who is the clinical nurse consultant for the Southeastern Sydney Intellectual Disability Specialist Team. Hi, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. So I'm gonna go through with you a few of the stats, I guess we have around uh, people with intellectual disability. Um, what their mortality looks like, and just a bit of a background for this. So I'll just get going. So in um, southeastern Sydney, we have about seven and a half thousand ish people with a diagnosed intellectual disability between ages 15 and 65, and 48,000 with a cognitive disability and southeastern and um, <laughs> sorry, in, in Sydney local health district. Um, in Australia wide, we have about 1.8% of the population with an ID. Uh, worldwide, that sits at about um, 3%, split between mild, moderate and profound. Um, a really important part to look at is people with intellectual disabilities across all age groups are at higher risk of developing mental health conditions than the general population. So that sits at about 30 to 42% of children will have some sort of mental health condition, 40 to 50% of adults and then 60% of older adults. And that's compared to 20% of the general population. So psychiatric disability is probably the most common comorbidity with an ID. So when we look at what causes intellectual disabilities, um, it's extremely varied, as you can see. We have a lot about the chromosomal abnormalities. Um, but as you can see this information from the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, most intellectual disabilities are of unknown origin. We have absolutely no idea what's going on. So people with intellectual disability, uh, their lifespan is increasing, but their health is poorer than that of the rest of us. Uh, so the life expectancy is around 58 and a half to 74, depending on the level of intellectual disability. Um, that's in New South Wales. In the UK, it's around 40 to 62. And of course, people with uh, Down syndrome have a lower life expectancy due to the, the health risks that come with that. Uh, compared to the non-disabled group amongst us, we enjoy a life expectancy of 83.35, very specifically. Um, uh, so next up, um, there are a range of internal and external factors are considered, but one of the biggest influences in um, health would be their access to healthcare. It's a huge problem. Um, across the board. We have a lot of research which tells us that people with intellectual disability receive inadequate care or the treatment that they get is just too late. Delayed diagnosis and inadequate management is of course disastrous for this population. Um, a study in 2016 in England found that 30%, 37% of the deaths of people with intellectual disability were classified as being amenable. That's compared to 22.5% of the rest of us. Um, there is also an overrepresentation of deaths related to respiratory and nervous system. And people with intellectual disability have lower levels of smoking and alcohol and illicit drug use. However, they do have a higher level of overweight and obesity and lower levels of physical activity. So the studies we have seen suggest that people with intellectual disability have an enormous amount of unmet health needs. The figure is that 62.9% of the people with intellectual disabilities in Australia have a chronic illness. So the chronic illnesses we're looking at would be hugely epilepsy, um, which is around 20% of people with intellectual disability compared to around one to the rest of us, constipation, visual impairment, eczema. And the most common health condition for people with intellectual disability is dental disease. Unfortunately, it's one that gets overlooked quite a lot. I guess the concern with that is that high levels of unmet need suggest that people with intellectual disability and their carers seem to have a lot of difficulty in identifying these health needs. So the evidence would suggest to us that people with an ID experience poorer experiences in healthcare system, poor health outcomes, shorter life expectancy, higher likelihood of going into hospital and longer stays. There is some research done recently 
to show that of 118 adults who had a recent hospital experience didn't have their needs met in a lot of ways. They didn't receive correct medications, they didn't get them on time, they couldn't necessarily get out to drink. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there's also um, uh, less access to preventative health programmes and they have more undiagnosed and untreated health conditions. So people with an ID, they have a very poor health status. Multiple barriers are there, um, affordable, appropriately equipped health services, and there seems to be a mismatch between health needs and accessible services for people with intellectual disability. There's enormous lack of health promotion and health, health <laughs> prevention out there, and there is an enormous elevation in mortality rates. So let's just uh, look at New South Wales in particular. 38% of the New South Wales ID cohort uh, were potentially avoidable, which is a fairly horrifying statistic. So in looking at the, the Ombudsman um, cause of death, so reviewable deaths for people with disability and residential care, uh, most of the deaths were unexpected. Um, and the, the my, one of the main ones coming up is respiratory. So aspirational pneumonia happens all the time, we see it all the time in disabilities, and that's just a list of all the sort of causes of death that were out there. <clears throat> so why? Why do we have such health inequality? So there are so many, so such a significant number of factors that affect the overall health status. So as I already said, difficulties in recognizing health problems, and then of course, communicating this to other people. Another part of that is being very reliant on carers, family or paid, to recognise signs of ill health. Um, so also looking at access to the healthcare is a significant problem, um, but it's also one that we can change, changing the access. Although we predominantly think about access being physical in relation to people with disabilities, it is much more complex than this. So we have limited services and an enormous one that we see every day is diagnostic overshadowing. It happens all the time and it's something that can be changed with education. Um, we also, there are studies that tell us there's quite a lot of negative attitudes amongst healthcare and staff or staff who just don't have the understanding or education or even necessarily the interpersonal skills to manage this. So as we know, there is a Royal Commission currently underway into the violence and abuse and neglect and exploitation of people with disability. So they're investigating um, protecting people with disability from <clears throat> experience violence. Um, they're looking to achieve best practice in reporting and investigating. And they're looking to promote a more inclusive society that supports people with a disability to be independent and to live free from violence and abuse. So up till now, it's still quite new. There have been a number of uh, public hearings, which I'm sure we've all seen, um, looking at accessibility to education and housing. There has been workshops covering advocacy, uh, legal justice and education and learning. Um, there's been ongoing submissions, issue papers, community forums, and there's a lot of research happening. Up next, there's gonna be more public hearings and really importantly, they're also having private sessions for this one to allow people to come forward um, knowing that their confidentiality will be kept. So barriers to accessing care. So the challenges that people with intellectual disability are facing um, in getting care and the care all working together is that there is a, it's extremely complex trying to get in with service provision. All the different services that are out there are very complicated and quite difficult to navigate. Um, engaging with it, mainstream services is something that we know that people with intellectual disabilities want to do. They want to access mainstream services like, like everyone else does. And that is quite that can be quite difficult. Um, one of the big challenges that I think I've seen a lot of is networking across organizations and all the organizations organizations don't talk to each other we all talk in different languages we all talk in different acronyms and we don't necessarily talk to each other either which makes life really difficult for people with an intellectual disability or their carers um, there's also the 
the big one at the moment is the NDIS uh, rollout, which has been great. But we had we've moved systems, we've changed languages, and I think that has created a lot of challenges uh, for a lot of people. And one thing I think when it comes to engaging with services and connecting with services is particularly that transition stage for teenagers who go from having that central pediatrician and they have this web of services around them and then you transition into adult services and that can be quite difficult when you're trying to engage with different services and you're having to do that potentially uh, on your own. So uh, access to healthcare for people with an intellectual disability is very complex um, and promoting um, equality within that requires a significant range, range of sponsor, responses. So we have to enhance the capacity of people with intellectual disabilities and the people that support them. I think really importantly though, we have to ensure that the health system they are accessing is able to respond to their needs in an appropriate and timely manner. And I think part of that is understanding why there needs to be a change. Well, that's fundamental in how we then achieve it. It is necessary to, for those who work in health to develop an awareness of what barriers are there um, and then how we can think more creatively about how we can get past that. I think one of the, the big ones, as I, as I said, is the, the lack of education. There's not a huge amount of education for our nurses and doctors and social workers and everyone else coming, coming through training now. There's a distinct lack of, um, of curriculum within intellectual disabilities. And that's something that we know is, is, is a big problem, but it's something that, again, we, we can fix that. But in terms of uh, promoting equity in healthcare, we know from lots of research that the implementation of annual health checks is one of the biggest, is one of the, the most substantial activities that can help improve health. So what can we do to improve access um, and health outcomes? As I said, the annual health check, that is the research tells us that that is the number one thing that we can do to improve people's health. So the health checks are the health assessment for people with an ID under the MBS. And there's also the CHAP tool, that is the, the one that's recommended by quite a few organizations. But there are lots of health assessments out there. Um, I guess we just find one that we enjoy or we like, or we think is more appropriate. So one of the things we're gonna talk about at length um, later in the presentation is reasonable adjustments for access in healthcare. So there are some really, really simple things that, that we can do every day to help, like offering longer appointments or communicating with our families um, who have an intellectual disability that when they're booking appointments to book a, a double appointment, just having that open communication. Easy read material is, 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 a, is a great one to have out there. And this is a really, a really great one is offering flexible appointment times. So you know within your practice or your service, what are your quieter times throughout the day? Those times are great for people who have intellectual disabilities potentially and have additional needs. Uh, a great one is alternate waiting spaces, if possible. I, I appreciate that that's not that's not uh, not everybody can do that, but somewhere that's slightly less stimulating, that's not as busy, that can be really helpful. Uh, home visits is one that I appreciate is difficult to manage for everybody. Uh, but those are ones that I think uh, can be really really helpful in this in this group. Um, also utilizing specialists, so referring on to specialists when you just, you're not sure, you're not sure where to turn it, is utilizing services, picking up the phone and asking people what they think. And really, really importantly is working with the partners in care. So who is supporting this person? Working with a wider group so we can support people more holistically. So that's me. I'm going to pass you over to Maria Heaton, who is a clinical nurse consultant for the SIPI team. Thank you, Paula, and thank you everyone for hanging in there. Very excited to be here today to talk to you. Um, so having listened to the issues uh, highlighted by Paula about access, uh, this uh, slide basically has a lot of the words that uh, refer to the barriers and challenges that families and people with intellectual disability experience. So what I'm going to be taking you on from here is the, view, uh, is the viewpoint of people with intellectual disability and uh, their carers and 
support workers. And in order to do this, I've um, had the opportunity to speak with a few of them whom I will introduce you to later in the piece. Not sure if everyone's uh, heard this story before, but this is my favorite uh, description of what a disability journey is like. And I'll just uh, read this to you. So Welcome to Holland was written by Emily Pearl Kingsley to describe the disability journey. It's like planning a fabulous holiday of a lifetime to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks and make your wonderful plans. The canals of Venice, the Colosseum, Michelangelo's David. You may learn some handy phrases in Italian. It's all very exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the plane lands. The stewardess comes in and says, welcome to Holland. Holland, you say? What do you mean Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. What do you mean Holland? I can't go there. I've dreamed of going to Italy all my life. But there's been a change in the flight plan. They've landed in Holland and there you must stay. The important thing is that you haven't been taken to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of pestilence, famine and disease. It's just a different place. So you must go out and buy new guidebooks. You must learn a whole new language and you will meet a whole new group of people you would never have met. It's just a different place. It's slower paced than flashy Italy. But after you've been there for a while and you catch your breath and look around, you begin to notice that Holland has windmills and Holland has tulips. Holland even has Rembrandts. But everyone you know is busy coming and going from Italy and they're all bragging about what a wonderful time they've had there. And for the rest of your life, you will say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go. That's what I had planned. And the pain of that will never, ever, ever go away because the loss of that dream is a very significant loss. But if you spend your time mourning the fact that you didn't get to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy this very special, very lovely things about Holland. My next slide is trying to give you a glimpse into the lives of families with a, of, with a person with ID, as well as a person with ID. And if you look through all the photos on this slide, there are happy moments, sad moments. There's moments of um, just activities of daily living, giving a person a shower, you know, doing things. It's, it's a roller coaster. Um, trying to give you a glimpse into the life, it's a mixture of emotional ups and downs and it's hard work, which equals high rewards. It's really important not to make a judgment about a person's quality of life. And one of the activities that I would strongly recommend to do is a self-reflection about your own values, beliefs, and life experiences that has given you these attitudes and values. The next time you care for a person with ID, you can then put your own values and attitudes to the side to focus on the needs of the person in front of you without any of these personal views clouding your vision. Some of the most challenging experiences for families is when health professionals, the people who are meant to help them, let them down. People with ID can have wonderful, fulfilling lives if they are surrounded by people who believe in them and support them to achieve their best potential. I've served with the New South Wales Council for Intellectual Disability Board, and 50% of their board is made up of people with intellectual disability. I wanted to share this quote by Jack, who's part of the uh, New South Wales Council for Intellectual Disability Board. And reading Jack's quote made my heart swell with pride. Jack is a happy and confident young man, living life the best way he can amidst all the So the Disability Discrimination Act discusses the responsibilities of uh, you as an employer and service provider about how to prevent discrimination and meet your responsibilities. The Australian Human Rights Commission can help you resolve issues that you may have may be concerned about. They run education programs and can support organizations to develop disability action plans. Action plans are a way for an organization to plan to eliminate as far as possible any disability discrimination from the provision of its goods, services and facilities. They also have a lot of information and resources on their website and you can find it by clicking on the link below. 
looking through the standards of general practice. Um, everything that we're talking about here today is actually covered in your own standards of practice. There's a statement on the website that says that these standards of practice have been developed with the purpose of protecting patients from harm by improving the quality and safety of health services. People with intellectual disability are a vulnerable population and as such, their needs need to be prioritized. The RACGP standards highlight in great detail reasonable changes that are expected of your services. This slide just addresses a few that I pulled out from the, the standards and it's about making reasonable adjustments in regards to communication with an individual with intellectual disability. It's about remembering the needs of the person and communicating in a way that's appropriate to the person and in the instance of a person with intellectual disability, the importance of involving their carer, family, uh, guardian or a disability support staff is really important. So now we've got a case study to discuss. Uh, this case study is probably one, one that you've come across in your practice. Um, a family present to you with concerns of their 13 year old son's uh, behavioral changes. He has intellectual disability as a result of brain tumor tr treatment. They've tried everything that they have in their repertoire to try and nothing's really worked. So now they've rocked up to your uh, practice and they're saying, can you help us please? So the question is, what can you do to help this family? So the first point that uh, Paula also addressed is waiting room challenges. So one of the consumers that I spoke to said that waiting rooms are often overstimulating for all the wrong reasons. And protracted waiting times can be very hard to explain to someone with intellectual disability who's sitting there in a crowded space, a small room, wondering why are we here? And it's really hard for them to, to, to understand that. Um, one of the mothers whom I spoke to said to me that one of the best experiences that she had with her GP practice was when the GP allowed her to call her head to explain that they were experiencing a lot of behavioral challenges. Uh, their son was unwilling to get out of the car. So the GP was able to go to the car and actually uh, do the uh, examination and the uh, assessment of the, of the boy in the car. Um, and one of the other uh, suggestions is to try and book appointments around quiet times. As Paula mentioned before, sometimes um, patients with intellectual disability can take a lot of time to do your history taking, your examination. And uh, so it's always ideal to recommend to the family when making appointments to do a double, double appointment. And uh, we do recognize that it, that it will be challenging to do a physical examination, especially when the person is, is not their best and is uh, behaviorally um, you know, not um, coping as well. So if you can uh, try to get, uh, get through what is possible. So uh, Alexis Berry was chatting with me about this and basically, you know, if, if they are willing to let you listen to their chest, but not open their mouth to have a, an examination of their mouth and just get through what you can in that uh, time frame that you've got. Uh, they probably won't tolerate much of an examination, but uh, you can reschedule an appointment in a couple of weeks and give their parent care, care or support worker a log to keep for the next couple of weeks before you see them around their eating, their sleeping and uh, their behavior, which might help in the assessment in a couple of weeks and then you can pick up with uh, completing the physical examination. Um, this mom also said to me that continuity of care is really important to her family and the practice that she visits has a large number of uh, medical practitioners there. And she thinks that over the, the 13 years, she's got to meet every single one of the practitioners. One of the good things about the practice is that uh, on a regular basis, they have a meeting where they discuss the more challenging uh, cases. And so she said it's been a, a real blessing that uh, regardless of which doctor she sees, they are abreast of everything that's happening with her son and she doesn't need to repeat uh, much, of the, much of the information. 
Uh, another family said to me, trust the family if they're saying that something's wrong, that uh, electively no one would choose to sit in a crowded uh, you know, waiting room uh, unless there was really a reason uh, to, to be there. So when uh, parents say that something's wrong, uh, wrong with their person and they're there for help just to uh, respect um, what they're saying because they've had years of observing, caring and implementing care plans with a person uh, with intellectual disability. And the most important point is to never ever assume that someone's change in behavior is because of their disability. And uh, for people with significant challenges with communication, often physical ex expression such as aggression might be the only uh, default method that they have to communicate that something's not right with them. And um, so to consider any behavioral changes as an important vital sign as well. We have another case study for you of parents um, from a non-English speaking background who only speak Arabic. Uh, their English language skills are very minimal. Uh, they've got a 16 year old son who developed uh, intellectual disability as a result of a severe uh, bacterial meningitis. Uh, he had an extended stay in hospital and uh, did an intensive uh, rehab program uh, with the hospital as well. And uh, the hospital has um, communicated to the family that they need to engage more with community services. And as a result, the family have come to your practice. They need to uh, find a GP and they hand you a lot of paper. And part of the paperwork is about uh, NDIS, and NDIS plan needing to be uh, up for renew. Review, sorry. So the next question is what support can you offer this family? So when you have a family with a non-English speaking background, it's always helpful to ask the family if uh, you would like, uh, they are happy to use an interpreter. Um, taking a comprehensive history is an opportunity to learn more about the family and the family members. And um, if you're going to hand them a, a plan to follow, having an idea about what the family dynamics are like and what other pressures are on the family will give you an idea about whether the plan that you give them is uh, in any way going to be followed or if it's unreasonable to expect them to continue that. Um, with your history taking, it's important to find out about their diet, their weight, the sleep, and any changes that has recently occurred in the person's life. Um, if the person is in a wheelchair, there's a high risk for them to develop pressure area. They can have joint and uh, bone issues as well. So looking into uh, doing some uh, health screening, if it's possible, um, provide information in as accessible uh, form to the family. Um, it's important to think proactively and look into what are the issues that this boy is likely to face in the future, to look at health screening, and um, looking at the age that he is, one of the services that would be of real value to him is uh, the New South Wales transitioning service called Trapeze. And Trapeze is one of the services that can help with his NDIS application and assist with also linking the family up to all the supports that they're going to need in the community. I'm just going to introduce Alex back. Hello, so we're going to move on to two adult case studies. And again, um, so I hope certainly these two are cases that I've been involved with and, and perhaps not too unusual in the GP context as well. So the first gentleman is a 30 year old man, he has Down syndrome. He lives with his very supportive and well-educated mum. He has coexisting autism, anxiety and OCD. And he doesn't really like doctors coming, you know, doesn't like coming into the practice very often and has actually been relatively well. Um, but he does hate needles and that's well, well documented. His mum brings him in because his mental health appears to be declining. He's not sleeping quite as well, he's a little bit more agitated, not engaging with his usual service providers in the same way that he has in the past, um, trying to, you know, not being able to stay in one setting, they'd be going out for dinner and he'd be getting a bit agitated and not eating the meal and, and getting up. And he hasn't 
he does have a psychiatrist um, who he sees, and but he hasn't had any blood tests in 15 years and hasn't really had a full comprehensive physical examination or a dental examination for a long time. His only medication is valproate as a mood stabiliser and the dose for that has been stable for at least 14 years. So there's lots of places where obviously you would want to start with this gentleman. You know, and top of the list would always be you'd really want to get a physical examination. Um, as mentioned, he, he wasn't a real fan of anyone getting too close in his personal space. Um, so the GP that was involved in this case really did try and tried over a couple of visits to, to get a physical exam undertaken. Never got to look in the ears, didn't really get to look in the mouth much more than, you know, quite superficially. Um, did get to be able to listen to the chest, which was great. And mum was able to do a skin check um, and a nail check um, to make sure there weren't any things like ingrown toenails. Um, there wasn't any concerns about bladder and bowel at this point in time in the history. So, you know, very reasonably, we know about some of the, you know, medical issues for people with Down syndrome. Um, and the GP really did want to get a set of bloods, very reasonably so. Um, first attempt was at the GP practice. Um, and didn't even get the tourniquet on. Um, so they thought, okay, well, maybe, you know, in a pathology centre when he, you know, they can go in at their leisure, he can have his distraction tools, perhaps the iPad, playing a video, some headphones, maybe that will work. Tried that, the pathology collector declined to take the, the bloods because he was too agitated at, at that point in time. So third option, well, you know, let's try a home collection. So at this point, he had been referred to our disability clinic um, because, you know, it was clear that he was going to need, you know, more of a team approach to um, getting him through the healthcare system at this point. So at our first visit, um, you know, again, came in with mum, we this time managed a little bit more of a, a physical examination um, and we decided, okay, let's try and do pathology at home. At this point, we, we had talked with mum about using some oral sedation and she was really not keen for that. Um, she didn't really want to give him any sedative medication. So we said, okay, well, you know, let's try it at home, time when you're relaxed. Um, there's some fabulous visuals around taking bloods. Um, the, one of the, those tools is called the Say Less, Show More. So we gave it to this family to say, you know, try and, you know, get him used to looking at what the blood collection procedure might be, see if that reassures him. It didn't work. The home collection also failed. Um, and the family came back to us and said, all right, you know, what are we going to do next? By this point, luckily, um, we, you know, mum was ready to trial some oral sedation. So we took the approach that we were going to trial some first at home and we, um, we use lorazepam. So we said to mum, okay, on a weekend day where you haven't got a lot on, you know, give him 2.5 milligrams and just see what the response is. How does he, how does he tolerate it? Um, she did that. It worked reasonably well, she said, and so we proceeded. Again, we tried another home collection um, with one dose of lorazepam and it didn't work. Um, he saw the needle, woke up, and that was the end of that. So we then decided to proceed to getting the blood collected in the hospital clinic, mainly because it meant that we were going to be able to titrate the lorazepam and we would have the support of you know, oxygen resus if we needed to. So in the end, he required um, three doses 
and we got a set of bloods. Um, and probably not unsurprisingly, um, he came back with being hypothyroid, was commenced on some thyroxin and is doing much better. So I guess for, for this case, um, we, you know, it, this whole process probably took about three months um, and it was very much, you know, a, a trial and error. So we, you know, we had to titrate to find the most effective dose. We had to, you know, we trialled the use of visuals, we trialled the use of social stories, we trialled distraction techniques, um, and all of which were probably needed in combination to get this blood collected. Um, in the end, we were very fortunate that within our hospital pathology um, service, they were able to put in place some reasonable adjustments. So we were able to have an early appointment. Our clinic nurse accompanied mum and son to that appointment so that she could provide that handover to the pathology collector um, and really ensure that the client didn't have to wait and that everybody had a little bit of reassurance and that somebody was there to support them. It's also important to, to recognise that even in this instance, even with oral sedation, um, mum still had to hold down his arm. And there was you know, some initial discussion as to what that meant in terms of overriding objection and consent, um, which if anyone's interested, we can certainly talk more to towards the end of this um, conversation but in this instance you know that we were able to get the bloods taken because um, we were able we scheduled the appointment for the blood collection to be on the day when clinic was also running so after he had the blood test which was clearly the most important thing um, we brought him back to the clinic and because he was still a little bit sedated we were able to get an ECG which we felt was really important if we were going to start looking at other medications um, that we might be thinking about using for his anxiety. And we were able to get a, a quite thorough physical examination without much um, resistance. So as mentioned, he came back as hypothyroid and was commenced on replacement therapy. We were in um, quite close conversation with his um, private treating psychiatrist and were able to send him copies of the ECG and the blood tests. And we had a, a valparate dose as part of those bloods as well as fasting lipids and sugars. Um, and that enabled the psychiatrist to feel a lot more comfortable about up titrating his ep um, epilim dose to one that was probably more representative of an adult as opposed to the adolescent when he was first commenced on it. He's, this gentleman since had two further sets of follow-up pathology to monitor his hypothyroid state. And we've been really, um, I guess, encouraged that over the, you know, the most recent dose as he's become more, I guess, familiar with the whole process, um, we've only needed one dose of the lorazepam and we've been able to get the blood collection with really minimal effort. So the second case um, again is one that I've chosen to use today to really highlight um, where GPs and specialist disability services might work um, together. So Mr B is a 68 year old gentleman he lives in shared housing. He has an intellectual disability of unknown origin and he's generally well. He, in, importantly, he doesn't have a guardian and he doesn't have an informal decision maker. So he's brought to his GP because he has an irritant type cough. He's had it for a few weeks, but he's otherwise well. He didn't tolerate a community chest X-ray and he, because of his behaviours, it was thought that it wasn't really much point doing it twice, um, but there was still enough concern around this um, new irritant cough to warrant, you know, pursuing to trying to get this x-ray. So he was referred to our ID Health Service, um, primarily for support accessing imaging. 
So he came to our clinic and, you know, again, we screened that referral and, and we recognised that, you know, this was a referral that shouldn't sit, you know, for just a routine appointment. So he was prioritised up the, up the list. Um, and we endeavoured on that day to take a chest x-ray. Now, that involved my, both myself and our clinical nurse in, in disability to, to accompany with his support worker who was, he was very familiar with and who knew him very well, um, up to radiology. And we, it took us about an hour of trialling multiple different ways, enabling him to have a break, going and having some lunch, going for a walk, coming back, trying again. Um, and in the end, um, we had to ultimately um, gown up in our lead gowns and support him to get that x-ray, you know, for the, you know, two minutes that it took. The x-ray identified a foreign body um, in his right main bronchus and we then proceeded for emergency guardianship for consent for a bronchoscopy with the respiratory team to remove the object. And um, not unsurprisingly, his chest miraculously disappeared, his, sorry, his cough um, ultimately resolved and which was a great outcome for everyone. So we'll now hand back to Maria um, to present a little bit more around consumer Thanks, Alexis. This word cloud has a lot of words that came out of the mouths of the consumers that I'd spoken to. Uh, one of the messages that came from them was around opportunistic testing. They said that uh, because it's such a challenge sometimes to be able to examine and to do blood tests on a person with intellectual disability, if the GP is able to uh, give the family some um, uh, investigation um, uh, requests, then when, um, you know, a, a GA or sedation is required, they will have that on hand to have the bloods done. Um, another thing that was mentioned was that um, it's really important to try and build a rapport with uh, the person with intellectual disability as well as the family. And uh, one of the tips that I have is that usually, uh, you know, the person has something that's of great interest to them. And uh, if you're able to add that to your file so that every time they come into your practice, you have a line of conversation to, uh, to follow, which will help them to feel really special and um, that you recognize and remember the conversation you had at their last appointment. Um, I really would like to acknowledge the contribution of uh, these carers. There were more carers that participated as well, but I haven't really uh, got their permission to share their uh, names and information. Uh, Jack's information was obtained from the New South Wales CID uh, website. Uh, Murray McDermott is a mother to a 13 year old boy with intellectual disability. And she's also a consumer representative for uh, uh, First Strides. And, um, oh, I forgot to put her name. Leila Hallam is the last person on the, on the slide. And she's the Consumer and Community Advisory Council Chairperson for Sydney Local Health District. This is another quote from um, uh, Jack. And basically, you know, it kind of sums up everything that we've been talking about, that Jack, who's achieved so much in his life, uh, you know, has several uh, roles that uh, he uh, participates in and uh, is an active member of society, says that uh, he feels lucky that he's able to use his voice, but it's often um, goes, uh, he's often unrecognized and people only speak to his mother. And uh, Jack says at the end that it's, um, that he really likes it when people talk to him in plain English and when they look at him when they are talking to him. Uh, one of the other things that one of the, the mothers said to me was that her GP uh, has given her um, their email address and it's really helpful that she's sometimes able to email through concerns and they have a bit of an email conversation. And the example she gave me was that her son had, um, she thought had a UTI and they weren't sure. So through this email communication, she was able to take a midstream urine specimen to, to the GP's practice 
and they were able to send it off, which helped her a lot because it's such an ordeal to try and bring her son into the, into the practice. These are just some uh, additional quotes. Um, you know, it's fair enough, the green quote, it says some, like this, this particular person said to me that usually when their son's health plummets, it's so rapid that they've got to call an ambulance, they've got to go to a hospital, but they still maintain a relationship with the GP around scripts and referrals. Um, so sometimes I think that, uh, you know, there are certain families within the community where they are able to gauge what their needs are, but regardless of how engaged they, they are with the GP uh, practice, they will need you to be with them. And um, especially after the transition period when they lose um, access to a pediatrician because of the child's age, um, you know, the, the input that you have from uh, all over the child's, uh, all through the child's life will hold in really good stead when they get uh, to the older ages. And uh, one of the moms says that she loves the GP practice, but uh, to keep in mind that this uh, GP practice is part of the Healthcare Homes Initiative, which means that they have, um, you know, special accreditation, I suppose, towards caring for families with uh, special needs. Um, so the following couple of slides are just some tools and resources that are out there to support people with intellectual disability and their healthcare needs. Um, hopefully, you know, it's, I guess, just a reference point to know that they are out there. And if you do need to um, access them, there's, as we're going to show in a, in a little bit, there's two teams that are very happy to point you in the direction should you need them. Um, so as mentioned, the, the top one was My Health Matters, which was the tool that you just saw used in that video. Um, the second one is called Admission to Discharge, which has been rolled out in the Southeastern Sydney Local Health District. Um, it's not quite as well um, integrated into the Sydney Local Health District. So some GPs may have come across this, but it's primarily a tool to support people through their ambulance journey, hospital admission, around um, knowing their needs and identifying what may need to be in place for discharge. Um, you may be familiar with the, the top five. Um, it was initially developed in the context of dementia support by the Central Coast Area Health Service, but it's proven to be really quite helpful for people with intellectual disability. And it's just about identifying and documenting what are the top five things that somebody would need to know about that person to enable them to engage with healthcare services and to support them, to reassure them. Um, so it can be you know, really simple things, you know, such as, you know, I need to read, I need to see this photo, you know, every day when I wake up. Um, if I don't, I'll, I'll become very agitated. It, whatever it is that's of relevance to that person. The fourth is what we um, mentioned previously, which is the Say Less, Show More um, package of material, which is primarily around visuals to support people um, to understand what happens when they go for a, a blood test. So you may have received some other information recently around the new MyCare Gateway, which has been launched by the federal government. Um, in Sydney Local Health District, this has been facilitated by the Benevolent Society, um, which is also apparently the case in southeastern Sydney. Um, but irrespective of that, it, you can go through the central portal, and that's supposed to be a one-stop sort of shop of services, information and support options for carers of people with any disability, including intellectual disability. Um, if the Department of Developmental Disability and Neuropsychiatry, which, of which the chair is Professor Julian Troller, based at the University of New South Wales, has some really useful and practical um, resources and education online, um, short, um, courses um, that you can do to get a better understanding around managing some of the comorbidities that are so common for people with intellectual disability, including behaviours, anxiety, depression um, and the like. So as 
uh, was mentioned in Paula's talk earlier that undertaking an annual health check is one of the most evidence-based um, interventions that a GP can do to improve the health of people with intellectual disability. And as was mentioned, there's a number of different um, tools that you can use to do that. Um, the CHAP is one that was developed up in Queensland. Um, it's incredibly useful. However, you know, there is a cost to use that, but you might find that some of your patients who live in a um, supported independent living service and their organisation may be um, utilising the chat and it might come with them to your health appointment. Otherwise, there are three options, including the Medicare health assessment. So I think hopefully by this stage, um, we're all on the same page that you know, intellectual disability is a, a complex health problem and demands an integrated model of care. And so we're now up to the point um, where we're going to introduce the two services um, in your districts. So a little bit of background. Um, New South Wales government, um, and this was really based on a lot of advocacy work, primarily from New South Wales Council for Intellectual Disability, highlighting the health inequalities of people with intellectual disability. Um, they were successful in lobbying the, the state government for the enhancement and extension of specialised intellectual disability health services. So, some of you may have been familiar that there were some existing teams um, throughout New South Wales. There was the Southeastern um, Sydney Local Health District team, which was based here at um, St George Hospital, um, otherwise known as DAS. There was a team based in the Northern Sydney Local Health District and a, part, a team also Sydney Southwestern Local Health District out of the Fairfield Hospital. However, the this did not equally you know, cover everyone within New South Wales. And so 7.6 million of additional funds were allocated in 2019 for the enhancement and ongoing funding of those existing three teams, as well as the development of three new teams. So the new teams are Sydney Local Health District, Western New South Wales Local Health District, and Hunter New England Local Health District. Each of the um, now six teams have a hub and spoke model so that they would also cover other local health districts, either one or two, um, to, so that in theory, every single person throughout New South Wales should have access to the specialised team in some format. In addition, um, two new mental health teams have been set up, um, paediatric team based in the Sydney Children's Hospital Network and the adult service is also based in the Sydney Local Health District. So the model of care for these teams, um, they are all multidisciplinary teams and they are all across the lifespan teams. So their focus is on the clinical assessment and development of a comprehensive case management plan and it's for people with intellectual disability and complex unmet health needs. And that's a broad term and we know that's a broad term and you know, that's because it, you know, the whole idea is it's not to be too narrow. So that's, you know, if you have a patient that has an unmet health care need, um, then it's open to you to access this service to discuss. Um, these teams have also been tasked with a role for capacity building and that is in multiple different um, forums, both in the hospital system, community health and primary health professionals like yourself. And not unsurprisingly, there is a reporting and accountability. So as mentioned, um, how the teams will work, there's the initial referral, um, goes through to intake and prioritisation. 
Um, that will then move on to the assessment phase and the assessment will, as mentioned, be a multidisciplinary assessment depending on the needs of that person. Um, that will result in a care plan and support to implement that care plan, um, follow-up referral um, and support um, and then transition back to once that health care need has been supported back to the usual health care provider. So in terms of how we hope to um, engage with yourselves as GPs, um, we're happy, you know, certainly for inquiries, there's no wrong door and if you know, we're here to support yourselves and to support people with intellectual disability. Um, we're certainly, you know, keen to be involved in case discussion consultations, joint reviews if required, um, provision of resources, information, research, um, and of course, multidisciplinary comprehensive clinical assessments. So this is the STRIDES team, which stands for the Specialist Team for Intellectual Disability Sydney. Um, so this is the team that if you put a referral through to, um, this, if your person lives within the Sydney Local Health District catchment, um, we're the team that it will come to. Um, so in our team, we have a full-time program manager, a full-time clinical nurse consultant, um, senior social worker, paediatrician, Dr. Jacqueline Small, myself as the adult rehabilitation physician. We have a neuropsychologist. Um, we will have a psychiatrist um, that's currently vacant in recruitment, um, a clinical nurse consultant with a mental health focus and our admin officer. And I'll let the Southeastern Sydney team introduce themselves now. Hello. Uh, so this is the Specialist Intellectual Disability Health Team um, for Southeastern Sydney. And we also support uh, Illawarra Shoalhaven Local Health District and Nepean Blue Mountains Health District as our outreach regions. Uh, we are fairly similar composition to the, the Sydney team. So we have a health service manager. We have myself as the clinical nurse consultant, senior social worker, uh, mental health pathway coordinator, who is a, a CNC. We have a pediatrician. We have a rehabilitation phys physician, a psychiatrist, and we also have full time, no, we don't have a part time admin officer. And I've just popped up on the screen some of the screen, the contacts for the teams. If you want to get in touch with us, please jot down those email addresses and we'd, we'd really like to hear from people quite soon. And yep. So we'll leave those up um, just for you to keep your breath. Um, I think so far, we haven't, we were given one question, which was what is stride? So hopefully we've been able to answer that question. Um, if there are any other questions or clinical comments, um, please send them through. We, we'd love to know about them. Um, as an aside, um, you know, we certainly recognise that at the moment it's a really challenging space to be operating in, in, in the times of COVID and that, that does present challenges in face-to-face -face contact. Um, last week, there was the presentation by a number of our other members of our team in relation to intellectual disability and COVID. Um, so just in case there are people tonight who weren't present for those um, presentations last week, um, to let you know that, that both teams are available to support you if you do have people with intellectual disability that you think need access to testing and have challenges. Um, both public health units are, are really keen to hear about um, people with intellectual disability who may need COVID testing and how, if they do need support, how we can facilitate that. So um, both, yeah, don't don't hesitate to get in contact with us if that's one of the other issues that is coming um, your way that you need some extra assistance with. Um, I think Jenny and Rory there, if, if there are any questions, we can't see them, but um, feel free to pass them on. Questions? 
there's no questions that have popped up in our chat, chat section. Uh, so I'd like to, on closing, um, thank you all, speakers, Dr. Alex Berry, Paula Griffin, Maria Heaton, and Dr. Chitra Parrott for um, taking the time to put the presentation together. It was a brilliant presentation and um, presenting tonight. And thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, you'll receive the evaluation link in your in, in email inbox shortly. And please be sure that you complete the evaluation. Your certificates will then be provided uh, within two weeks. Um, now, Rory, there's no more questions. Um, I can't see. Just got to no. uh, additionally, uh, follow uh, if you're following our web, web pages, uh, the next session, session two, uh, will be Thursday the 20th of August, Health of People with Intellectual Disability, Ad Adolescence and Early Childhood, Early, early Adulthood, sorry. Um, this and the remainder two sessions are advertised on our website. Um, so are there any closing comments to the speakers? Hi Jenny, it looks like there are a few questions that came through. Um, I've just allocated them through to Paula. All right, thank you. Thanks Rory. Can you see the questions? Um, we're looking. Rory, could you read that out? Sorry. Yes. <clears throat> so one is, if behavioural issues have been medically examined, would the next step be a psychiatrist review? <laughs> um, possi possibly. I guess it is the option to that. So um, behavioural challenges are, are definitely one of the, if not probably the most difficult thing to be able to assess and develop a management plan within um, you know, one appointment. So generally no person with intellectual disability, I guess, exists as an island where the information will only be available, you know, in one setting. So, you know, if you've got somebody, for example, living in um, with family, you might get the information from the family, but you might not be getting the, the story from the school. If they're going to a community participation program, you might not be getting the information from that setting. Um, and one of the most really difficult things around behaviour is that you need to understand where, what role the environmental factors are playing in, in driving those behaviours. So certainly, absolutely, you know, the first point is that having to, you know, first we always have to exclude the physical. Um, you know, the most obvious reason causes being constipation, um, you know, toenails, ingrown toenails, dental problems, you know, ear, ear infections. Um, they're, you know, by far and away, you know, one of the driving causes of challenging behaviours. And, and then the next most significant cause is usually the environmental factors. And, and it's not uncommon that we'll, you know, with a good history um, and opportunity to explore those different settings, get a better understanding where, where some of those behaviours might be coming from. And I think that that's a real difficulty for GPs to be able to have those, you know, that time to be able to get that information. In the NDIS world, we have behaviour support practitioners um, and it's one of their roles to do that, but we all know that the waiting list for one of those is, is extremely long. Um, so I think it, in that context, you know, we would certainly be open to um, discussing, you know, the, whether there has been challenging behaviour um, and then referral on to a, a psychiatrist it, who might be able to do more of that background and environmental um, probing is most likely going to happen and warranted. Um, I think Dr. Carroll might want to comment as well from the yeah. pediatric point. And um, I, I'm the developmental pediatrician and just would like to add that in children with intellectual disability, uh, quite, quite a few times, autism spectrum disorder is one of the common comorbidity. And behavioral challenges becomes a major issue in that context. And yes, definitely physical examination to rule out physical comorbidities. 
is the way to go. But in addition to that, there are always neurodevelopmental profile related challenges such as sensor issues. Uh, quite a few times, ADHD becomes part of the presentation and constant hyperactivity. And not the least, communication adds on, not being able to communicate. And the whole gamut of challenges which comes with the autism spectrum profile really makes it complex to tease it out further. So yes, it requires a series of um, uh, appointments as well as gathering collateral data from the school, therapists and analyzing it further. So at the GP level, at times it can be tricky, but uh, we understand that as long as the matter gets escalated further through the pediatricians as necessary, um, we are able to come up with a management plan. And it's always work in progress, trialing, tweaking out and working out what is the driving factors underlying. Thank you. And I'll just see what's the next question. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, what is the best way for exercise physiologists to advocate for a person with intellectual disability within the GP framework? I'm an exercise physiologist with vast experience within the intellectual disability sphere. I have previously worked with um, SDHT Fairfield, have worked with uh, Professor Julian Troller and 3DN, have completed my master's in research in improving cardio, metabolic um, uh, health for people with disability, intellectual disability, and planning on commencing a PhD in the area. Um, thank you. So absolutely, we know that people with intellectual disability do not do enough exercise, they're not active, um, and that this has the obvious health issues associated with sedentary behaviour and especially when you start looking at the number of people who are also on psychotropics and the adverse cardiometabolic profile that those medications have, um, ex, you know, increasing physical activity for people with intellectual disability is probably one of the most efficient ways of improving their health for, you know, low um, I guess low cost and low risk. So one of the bonuses now that we have within the NDIS framework is that there is more opportunity for people to um, utilise their funding in ways that they previously haven't been able to access services. Um, within our services, we would absolutely always be looking at what sort of exercises that person do. Um, you know, working with adults, one of the things that we always know is that at the time of transition, you know, during school, exercise is built into the curriculum and most young people do meet um, at least an, an exercise activity target that's not that dissimilar to um, their peers, but that drops off quite significantly at the time that they leave school because there's no longer any program physical activity into their week and the sedentary behaviours, um, you know, are increased quite significantly. So absolutely, as a GP, really... Um, you know, I would absolutely support um, the question that talking to your person, um, your patient around their, what their exercise they do do, what they might like to do, and talking to them about, you know, developing a plan that might involve um, exercise physiology is a really important and, and well, um, well evidenced um, intervention to improve their health. So thank you for bringing that up. So I think, Jenny, I think Jenny and Rory, that, would uh, that be um, about it? Yes, thank you, um, Alexis. Thank you very, very much. Um, and there doesn't Great. appear there to be any more questions. Um, so once again, um, thank you to the speakers, Dr Alexis Berry, Paula Griffin, Maria Heaton and Dr Chitra Parra for taking the time to present tonight. Um, remember to look on um, online for these um, recorded sessions, for the recorded session last week on COVID, an ID for this session, tonight's session, and um, we'll be having another three sessions. So uh, session two will be adolescence and early adulthood. Session three will be specific conditions across the lifespan. 
and session four will be focus on a focus on complex health issues. So keep an eye on the website. Um, and thank you again for um, all the attendees and for attending, attending and the speakers. And um, good night. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks.